Okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> welcome. Uh, my name is Brett Solomon. I'm the Executive Director of Access Now. And I'd like to welcome you to this session, uh, a very important session, I would say. And looking at the digital, digital surveillance crisis, um, the threats to human rights defenders. And, um, you know, we have a pretty extraordinary lineup of speakers. So I'm super thrilled and, in fact, quite honoured to be here. Uh, we're here to discuss the digital surveillance crisis and the threats to human rights defenders uh, in some detail, as I mentioned. And we have um, um, a special thanks to our co-organisers and the International, together with Access Now, have put together uh, this session. I'd like to also acknowledge the co-sponsors. So um, we have Norway, um, we have the Office of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders. We have as co-sponsors the International Service for Human Rights, ISHR, Civicus, and OSF. Thank you uh, very much to the co-organisers and to the co-sponsors for putting on this event. Uh, we have a range of, as I say, of extraordinary speakers. Uh, we have Mr. Odin Kalam, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN uh, from Norway, uh, who is also, as I say, co-sponsor. We have Siddharth um, Varadarajan, who is the founding editor of The Wire. We have Onyes Kalamar, who is the Secretary General of Amnesty International. We have Mary Lawler, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders. Welcome to each of you, and thank you very much for your precious time. And we also will have a couple of interventions from the floor as well. Uh, Mohammed al Maskadi, who will be familiar to many of you as a Bahraini human rights activist and human rights defender, uh, who also works with frontline defenders, and also Emily Martinez, who is the director of the Human Rights Initiative um, in its evolving form at OSF. OSF. So welcome to you as well. Um, as you're aware, this event will be live streamed on Access Now's YouTube channel. So for those of you who are watching, um, you're probably watching it on the YouTube channel, but if you need to point um, the direction to people, you can go to accessnow.org. In the top right corner, there's a little play button which will take you to the YouTube page and uh, you will see um, the link to, to, this, uh, to this broadcast. And we will also, of course, record it and we'll be um, publishing the link uh, later on. So um, we have about an hour and a half for this session. We have a lot to get through. Um, I actually just wanted to start off with the, the sort of the title of this session. It's about uncovering the iceberg. And I think that's in part because this sector and the crisis that we're experiencing has more below the water than above it. Part of our job today is to look beneath the surface and to see what's lurking. Um, I also want to note that today is Global Encryption Day, and it's absolutely important that we recognise the essentiality of encryption for human rights defenders. And uh, some of the speakers will talk to the importance of that. You know, this is a mathematical equation to secure our communications. And we need to ensure, particularly for human rights defenders, that their communications are safe and secure, particularly from those actors who would use spyware to try and make us more vulnerable. Now, um, this event discusses how states facilitated by private companies are unlawfully, and I underline that word, are unlawfully deploying targeted surveillance technologies against civil society around the world. And right now, the General Assembly, the 76th session, is looking at the Human Rights Defender Resolution, uh, which gives us an opportunity actually to discuss the effects of digital surveillance on the activities and safeties of human rights defenders. And I look forward to speaking to the permanent representative uh, from Norway on that resolution because, he, uh, because Norway is the sponsor of that. So um, before I hand over to, the, to our first speaker, um, I think it's clear that we've, I think we've often thought about surveillance impacting the right to freedom of expression and privacy. So, you know, and association, Article 12, Article 19, Article 20. But we've also seen, and Agnes will be able to talk to this, no, no doubt, it's also about the right to life, as well as we've seen Khashoggi and other human rights defenders and journalists. Um, many of us on the call have called for export regulation reform over the last 10 years. Um, what we've seen is that this surveillance technology sector has grown exponentially and it also has grown unconstrained. So, and new forms of technology have formed as well. So, 
So, um, you know, we're seeing intrusion and inception, interception spyware, but we're also seeing filtering technologies, biometric technologies, um, which are forming unlawful surveillance and repression. So let's hand over to the speakers. Let's think also proactively about what are we going to do about this crisis. Um, um, and let's just remember also that it's not just about human rights defenders. I think on the 20th of July, after the Pegasus um, project um, was released, we found that 14 heads of state were also revealed as, as targets of Pegasus malware. So really no one is safe, not the Catalan politicians, not the priests of Togo, and certainly not many people on the call and those who are watching. So with that, um, please let me hand over to the Deputy Permanent Representative of, to the UN from Norway, Mr. Odin Kalheim, the floor is yours. And you'll have to take yourself off mute, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, really appreciate it. And many thanks to you, uh, to Access Now, uh, Amnesty International and International Service for Human Rights for, for convening us. Um, this is uh, indeed a very important and timely discussion uh, that, uh, that we're, we're having on, on this topic. Um, dear colleagues, partners and friends, um, the situation for human rights defenders is deeply concerning. The COVID-19 pandemic further exacerbated the negative trends that we have experienced. Now, last year saw the highest number of human rights defenders killed as recorded by frontline defenders. Human rights defenders also continue to face threats, harassment, intimidations, and reprisals. Negative narratives and smear campaigns persist. Despite this, human rights defenders have played a vital role in promoting and protecting human rights during the pandemic in what has been dubbed a human rights crisis as well as a health crisis. Digital means for communicating, organizing, or engaging with their communities and with governments and authorities have been keen for many human rights defenders to continue their work. However, it's increased their exposure to digital threats, online harassment and intimidation, and unlawful surveillance. The news reports this summer about the use of surveillance technologies to target journalists, human rights defenders, political opposition members and others, is a stark reminder of this. The freedom of the press and an active civil society are prerequisite for an active democratic society. Unlawful surveillance risk creating a chilling effect in society where civil society, human rights defenders and others refrain from participating and speaking out. The deterioration in the situation for human rights and shrinking civil, civic space around the world, exacerbated by the pandemic, affects us all. Human rights defenders are at the front line. It's against this backdrop that we have made it priority to facilitate a, human, a resolution on human rights defenders in the UN General Assembly again this year. In the resolution, we propose to address both the ongoing threats, including digital threats, faced by human rights defenders, as well as to recognize the value of their work, their contribution to human rights, rule of law and democracy, and then the realization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We hope that the General Assembly will once again agree on a strong resolution recognizing the legitimate work of human rights defenders and the need, to, and the need for protection, not least online. I also hope that the panel here today will be able to shed more light on the effects of digital surveillance on the activities and safety of human rights defenders that can be used to inform the resolution, as well as measures that will allow defenders to continue their work unhindered. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Um, I'd like to follow up with a, a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, in particular, you mentioned the, the resolution um, and, and um, you know, it's something that many of us have been tracking closely. Firstly, I just want to say thank you very much to the government of Norway because uh, it's absolutely essential at this point in time where human rights defenders are under so much um, threat and I'm so pleased again to have Mohammed on the call to be able to talk about this from a personal perspective. Um, 
and also Siddhartha, I would say, as well, who's experienced Pegasus. Um, but, you know, the, the, the question that I have for you is, um, I think this is the first time that the resolution may include um, some language on surveillance technologies. And um, I'm interested to hear, you know, what sort of language is, is, is proposed in that um, resolution, and in particular, um, you know, is there a recall? Is there a call to refrain from the sale, transfer, and use of surveillance technologies? Is it sort of preventative in the sense that we're trying to to limit that trade, um, or um, is it also looking at the remedy as well in response to you know when human rights defenders are actually impacted by surveillance technology? Thank you, Brett. Now, I'll head, I hate to be a sort of a very, the, the, the diplomat with very diplomatic, opaque uh, answers, but we're still in the very early stages of intergovernmental uh, informals on this, and uh, it wouldn't be right for me to, to get into the language that is, uh, that is uh, 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 on the table uh, on this uh, now. Um, but uh, it is one of the reasons why we put so much emphasis on this, uh, this event, um, which we're very grateful to participate in, um, uh, that we think that this is a new element that warrants more attention and, uh, and belongs, uh, and we should have, uh, we will certainly work for uh, clear and uh, concise language on this in the resolution. Thank you so much. And it's fine to be diplomatic. <laughs> I know that it's, it's part of your, your, your purpose and your role. Um, and, and indeed, the actual development of the resolution involves and engages a process of diplomacy in order to come to agreement between all of the member states, um, which I know is a difficult process. I understand that there are informals and various stages to get to this final text. Um, certainly from the perspective of civil society, and I know that a letter has been sent through which sets out some of the language that civil society is looking for, and it does indeed address, um, you know, even from the special rapporteurs which talked about a moratorium uh, on the sale of surveillance technology, certainly until such time um, as there is the proper international regulatory framework in place, because at the moment what we're seeing essentially is you know, an unregulated, out of control, I would say, environment in which human rights defenders are experiencing, you know, attacks, which hopefully that resolution will help to, to at least slow down. Um, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, I would like to, to move to um, Siddharth now. Uh, Siddharth, come and sit back down. <laughs> this is your time. I think you can probably hear me. Um, please, um, it'd be great to hear from you. Your experience is very personal and <coughs> practical. Um, and we'd love to hear more about your work at the at the at uh, the wire and the experience of India and the Peg and Pegasus, which is, you know, the, the surveillance product from the NSO group. Thanks very much, Brett, and uh, thank you, Access Now and the organizers of this panel. Uh, I'll be brief and quick. Uh, in the five minutes I have, uh, I will try to describe the work we've done, what our findings uh, as part of the Pegasus project were and what the implications of the surveillance that we have uncovered, uh, particularly of human rights defenders, the media, and of opposition politicians means uh, in the wider political sense. Uh, I speak here as, uh, as a journalist who uh, not only covered the story of the use of Pegasus in India uh, as part of the Pegasus project uh, led by Forbidden Stories and with the participation of around 15 or 16 global media organizations, but I also speak here as somebody whose who's phone was targeted with Pegasus. And we found uh, when we did a forensic test of my phone uh, that uh, they were that my phone had indeed been infected with Pegasus in 2018. And uh, so was the phone of a colleague of mine, uh, co-founding editor at The Wire, uh, MK Venu, as well as other colleagues, um, at the wire and in total something like 40 journalists across India. Uh, so, so very quickly, uh, what are findings? You know, we, we had a list of around 1400 uh, Indian uh, telephone numbers, which uh, featured on this database, uh, which was a database of uh, a client of the NSO group. Uh, and uh, these were numbers that uh, were probably selected for 
or probably um, intended for um, deployment of Pegasus. We were not able to, you know, we, we cannot say with certainty that all 1400 were targeted because uh, the way we approach this methodologically, we wanted to do forensic uh, tests on uh, suspected devices in order to conclusively say that they were indeed targeted with Pegasus. Uh, but uh, there are lots of numbers that we identified which belong to you know, people. Uh, and uh, broadly speaking, if one individual had five or six of his numbers on the list, on the database, uh, his own numbers or numbers of his family or co-workers, uh, that uh, in our mind increased the probability that they were in fact uh, you know, subjected to surveillance with Pegasus, although un unless we were able to examine their phones, we couldn't say so conclusively. So broadly speaking, we tested, we, we identified around 200 people uh, by name uh, whose numbers were on this list. And we approached around uh, 50 or 60 people with a request that they allow us to test their phones. Uh, understandably, not many were willing. Uh, roughly a half said no and, and around half said yes. So we tested around 22 or 23 phones and found a pretty high strike rate, something like 15 to 16 of those phones turned out to either have an active Pegasus infection or uh, traces of uh, an attempted Pegasus infection. So in other words, an attempt, an attempt to infect, but we don't have clear evidence that that attempt was successful. I should say that the technology for testing Android phones is, uh, is not very well developed and it's next to impossible to, to detect um, the you know, traces of Pegasus on an Android. So many of the phones that, that turned up negative were in fact Android phones. But broadly speaking, of the uh, 14 or 15 actual targeted, you know, conclusively proved uh, individuals who were targeted, it includes myself, other, other journalists, it includes human rights defenders, it includes a, 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 a major opposition politician who was actively involved in an election campaign on behalf of an opposition party against the ruling Bharti Janta Party, a Prime Minister Modi. Uh, his name is Prashant Kishore. And uh, it also included a young woman the list, uh, I mean, we couldn't test her phone, but there were something like six or seven numbers of hers on this list. A young woman who had accused the serving of the sitting Chief Justice of India of sexual harassment uh, in 2019. And shortly after she went public with her complaint, uh, we found that her number had been added onto this database. Uh, and there were also other people, you know, lawyers who were, uh, in, uh, who were on this data. So it's a very, very large section of people. But um, I would say that if we are trying to understand the implications of, uh, you know, uh, and, and I also want to say, uh, the question obviously arises, who is it who did the targeting? And since NSO Group says it, it only sells uh, Pegasus to governments, governments that are vetted by the Israeli Ministry of Defense, uh, it's clear that it was, it was a government uh, or a government agency that targeted all of us. Question is which government? Uh, NSO group will not disclose the identity of its clients and the government of India has stonewalled uh, uh, all requests, including from the Supreme Court, uh, for, uh, for them to, to say whether or not they have used Pegasus. Uh, however, based on the kind of individuals selected, plus the fact that in the 2019 WhatsApp revelations, something like 21 or 22 lawyers and human rights defenders also had confirmed uh, Pegasus infections, it's fair to surmise uh, uh, on the base, you know, using the same yardstick that the British High Court uh, earlier this month used in the uh, in the case of the targeting of the the former wife of the the ruler of of Dubai, <clears throat> that in all likelihood this, these are you know government of India agencies that have targeted us. So the question is implications of this. Well, <clears throat> when human rights defenders and journalists are subjected to surveillance of this kind highly intrusive uh, surveillance. It's clear that uh, an, an attempt is being made to undermine the work they do. Um, this is obvious. Um, I would also say that uh, this has deeper, wider implications for electoral democracy too. Because the fact that we found evidence of Pegasus being used against opposition politicians, that too in the midst of elections. We had one confirmed infection and several phone who was the president of the Congress party in the 2019 general election in India. When such people are targeted for surveillance of this kind uh, in the middle of an election, you can imagine that this is an attempt by the government and by the ruling party to use public money 
because all of these technologies are purchased on the basis of, uh, of public funds. So to use public money, to use public resources in order to gain direct personal slash political benefit for the ruling party. To my mind, this is a, a scary, uh, but uh, a, you know, a realistic dimension of what this Pegasus project has unveiled that we need to embrace, that the very, mm. the very integrity of the electoral process in the world's largest democracy also stands compromised. So yeah. apart from the implications for human rights and for, for free media, the fact that electoral democracy is also being threatened is something very, very serious. And I'll stop. Yeah. Siddhar, thank you. Thank you so much for, 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 your, um, for your intervention there. And thanks very much also for the work that you've done in India on this matter. I mean, I think many of us around the world were watching what was the, the political crisis and scandal that emerged as a result of your reporting and others uh, on, on this matter. Um, and, and thanks also for kind of broadening out the discussion from the, the role of kind of, you know, the journalist and the human rights defender and looking at its impact on the very electoral, you know, democratic system that's the foundation of, of, of India's, you know, the way India operates and hopefully does continue to operate as a democracy going forward. But this is a real challenge, obviously, to, to, the, the, to the whole system. Um, can I maybe I'll, I'll follow up with the question there, but I, I'd want to ask you about what does it feel like to be a journalist? You know, you're sort of your starting point. What does it feel like to be a journalist that's reporting on Pegasus and at the same time um, a victim of, of, of the malware as well? And I want people to understand who are watching what this what Pegasus actually does. It gives the attacker full access to to the smartphone, to its data, to its images, to its photographs, to its conversations, um, as well as access to the camera, to the microphone and your location as well. So how does it feel to be somebody who's targeted uh, and, and potentially experiencing all those violations and at the same time reporting on it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, there's no doubt that you feel uh, assaulted, you feel violated as a journalist, as as an individual, because the right to privacy is so central to our being, and you know we carry our smartphones everywhere. It's not just journalists who do that, right? So this is a very deep uh, kind of violation of one's the integrity of one's being, right? But but as a journalist, uh, you know one always assumes, living in the kind of societies that we do, that uh, we would be the victims of surveillance of one kind or the other. So uh, many of us, even prior to this, were taking you know precautions like like using encrypted messaging apps and so on. What Pegasus does is that it gives the government insight into uh, even encrypted communication, right? So nothing is secure. And what this means for our own tradecraft, uh, and I, I want to emphasize this for for journalists out there, that you need to take standard, you need to take the clever and important precautions. Uh, sensitive, you know, material uh, or sensitive meetings. Maybe it's best to discuss that in person. Keep your phones off. Don't take your phones to those meetings. However, and this is what I want to underline, you cannot let the fear of Pegasus or the fear of surveillance um, deter you from doing the work that you need to do. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, uh, much as I have um, found it important to tell people about the dangers of Pegasus and to also tell fellow journalists, uh, I also feel it's important to underline the fact that uh, the, the reason why Pegasus is being deployed against us is to stop us from doing our work. And we shouldn't let fear uh, uh, you know, do 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 the government's work for itself, right? So use precautions, but don't be frozen. Uh, don't be that deer in the headlights who stops uh, stops uh, doing journalistic work. And I think that's something that we are trying to internalize and also tell others about. Mm. I mean, I think this is the the perfect segue to uh, Agnes to to speak next, uh, who you know, in her both in her previous capacity uh, as as um, Special Rapporteur and now Secretary General is engaged directly with the impact of you know, surveillance technology on journalists uh, and on human rights defenders. And I, Sadat, I'll come back to you and maybe also to Muhammad as well about this, this concept of self-censorship because the fear of surveillance means that people are not reporting. It means that individuals are not having conversations or sharing content um, because of the possibility of surveillance and what, what kind of chilling impact and effect that has on 
on the human rights system um, and on individuals to be able to advance their human rights agenda in whichever country it may be. Um, so, Anya, so let me hand over to you. And I'm, I'm uh, again so thrilled that you're on this uh, on this call uh, uh, on this session um, because, as I say, your experience uh, over many years in this field. So, please, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you to um, to the organizers and to the sponsors of that uh, of that event. It's a pleasure to be here. So Amnesty International uh, was a technical expert on the Pegasus project, and um, my, my colleagues uh, spend a lot of time in the months leading to uh, the release of the project and afterwards uh, reviewing uh, the technical dimension of the project and in particular inspecting uh, a large number of, um, of phones. Uh, what uh, what they found at the time is that um, of the of the targets that we could identify, at least 180 journalists in 20 countries had been selected for potential targeting with the NSO spyware. And since then, um, my colleagues at Amnesty Tech have continued to inspect a, a number of phones that have been brought to. Um, uh, to our attention. Uh, in addition to the journalists and the human rights defenders, as you pointed out, Brett, a number of politicians, including at very high level, a prime minister, president, and so on, have also been uh, targeted. So I think that the key message here is that we need to see these spywares as weapon. They are a weapon. They are weapons against human rights. They are weapon against the right to privacy or against freedom of the press. They are weapons against democracy, as uh, Sadat highlighted. They are weapons against free and fair elections. They are weapons against the rule of law. And I will add that they are weapons against the principle of the UN Charter, because what Pegasus revealed is that a number of states used uh, the spyware to spy on individuals on the territory of another country. And that is uh, actively prohibited by the UN Charter. The UN Charter prohibits this kind of unlawful intervention on the territory of another country. So that spyware is frankly, uh, potentially, if not in real term, uh, a threat to international security. And I, will, um, I, I want us to really be fully cognizant of the impact of that um, of that spyware and of the potential impact of that spyware if we do not take measures if we do not uh, intervene none of what none of the um, stories are simply anecdotal which is the other thing that pegasus revealed it's a global scale of the phenomenon it's how many countries were concerned by it, how many individuals were concerned by it. The fact that there are 50,000 numbers of potential surveillance targets, and God knows there may be other lists somewhere else. So um, I think it's really important to understand that uh, since and after Pegasus, we can no longer think that these are anecdotal problems, that these are just the uh, the result of rogue behaviors of a few individuals or a few states. This is an international issue. This is a global phenomenon and it requires a global response. Um, just to give you maybe a, a quick sense of some of um, the scope of it, um, we identified 11 countries as NSO clients, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Hungary, India, Kazakhstan, Mexico, Morocco, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Togo, and the United Arab Emirates. These are the ones we are aware of in relation to NSO. These are not the country that may have their own tool and their own spywares. And what this list also underlines is the, the breadth of it, the fact that it is actually a, a very, um, you know, it's every continent 
and every kind of political regime that is being concerned. So that's uh, that's the important point. Second, um, what our technical investigation has shown is the range of phones that have been targeted, including supposedly the most secure phone. The NSO spyware successfully infected iPhone 11 and iPhone 12 models. Uh, after the work that we did, after the work, in fact, that also Citizen Lab did, I just want to uh, mention them because they played a key role, Apple uh, issued a security update to protect the data and information of an untold number of, um, of users. So it's number of countries targeted, kind of uh, nature of the targets, all kind of people, not just human rights defenders and journalists, but politicians, lawyers, and so on. And it is a kind of tools that can be targeted. No, no tools is currently protected against uh, that, uh, that spyware. Fourthly, what, what uh, the Pegasus project has also shown is the impact of these um, uh, of this spine. We've already heard about the, the potential or the real impact on uh, the integrity of the democratic process in, in India. I want to talk about the case that is very close to my heart, which is uh, Jamal Khashoggi, a very well-known um, uh, Saudi journalist that was executed by the state of Saudi Arabia in 2018. We knew already that um, even if maybe not his phone, but the phone of his closest friends had been uh, targeted already. What we have also found is that after his um, execution, uh, people associated with him have uh, been targeted, including Atiche Sengis, his, um, his fiancé, including the, the prosecutor that was investigating in Turkey uh, the case um, against um, Saudi Arabia. So um, the, the, the nature of the violations that are attached to this uh, spyware are much broader than privacy or freedom of expression. The spyware is a tool for further violations, including mm -hmm. killings, including disappearances and worse. So we need to understand that people spy in order to get something. Uh, and of course, the surveillance itself is a violation but there is a lot of implications and a lot more violations after, after that. So in summary, uh, the Pegasus project blew wide open the global scale of the human rights abuses that are committed uh, through and with the use of the NSO's Pegasus uh, spyware. Uh, and it demonstrated that this was happening on a massive scale and on a global scale. Anyas, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I have like 15 follow up questions, but I don't have time for all of them. Um, but I um, but we have another round of, of questions as well. So that's good. Um, and, and thank you for so eloquently explaining the, the significance of the Pegasus project, because it's not just about Pegasus or NSO, it's actually about the whole sector, this the evolution of the surveillance um, um, you know, industry that has grown up without any real form of, of regulation control. Um, when I talk about, you know, the sort of um, the iceberg where actually much of this is happening under the water and it's a much bigger volume, um, is that this, the whole, um, the way in which the, the private sector has profited from this and has been able to, um, you know, create this essentially a system of weaponry um, without any of the international system, you know, being able to see what's going on. And, and I think that the Pegasus Project ditch has shone a light uh, onto NSO, but also, as I say, into the whole regime that's, that's you know, that's causing such significant human rights abuses. And, and, and I, I'm particularly interested in the Khashoggi uh, case. And, I, and you mentioned that many of the people that were around him were actually uh, had their phones infected, uh, not even necessarily him. And, and the point being that the puzzle, um, you know, when a person is, um, a phone is infected with, with spyware like this, 
it actually reveals a whole community, a whole network, an address book, etc. So to get to Khashoggi, to the, the, the people around him were infected. And I, um, which just sort of, I guess, shows the, 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 the network effect of this. Um, and particularly in the human rights community and the human rights defender community, where there is a lot of solidarity between communities, between marginalized populations. So um, I guess my question for you is, um, given that your report came out in 2019, uh, and now it's 2021, is there further analysis or further kind of revelations as a result of the Pegasus project that you kind of may have, you know, thought that might be the case, but now when, you know, in 2021, you realise that the surveillance regime was actually entrapping Khashoggi, like is there new revelations or new understanding of what actually took place that you would like to add to your report that you, you sent to the United Nations? Um, thank you, uh, Brett. Um, first of all, I, I would like to point out that we don't know whether uh, Jamal's uh, phone was targeted because no, right. we, we don't have it. Uh, it's uh, in the hands of the Turkish authorities. And while I do not want to question at all the um, technical capacities of the Turkish government at the time, I don't know whether they had the capacity to determine whether the phone had been um, targeted. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a super complicated um, process, in fact, to find uh, traces of the spyware. And that's why it is so um, destructive, potentially, because it's so difficult uh, to, to find, it's so difficult to control, uh, and, and it can get into your phone without you doing anything at all. So we don't know whether uh, Jamal's phone was, um, was targeted. And my, my feeling, frankly, after the Pegasus project that I wish we could get hold of his phone. I have suggested that to the Turkish authorities and you know, so that we could really try to see even if the time has passed, whether indeed it had been targeted. Second, I found, I found it absolutely shameful um, beyond words, but everything about Jamal, Jamal's killing is of course uh, shameful, that they should have gone after uh, Atiche at a time when she was such so vulnerable. Uh, and when, you know, every, every photo you see of her during that period, she has her phone in her hand. So that was her lifeline during that period, particularly when she was still hoping that uh, Jamal was alive and maybe detained somewhere, disappeared somewhere. That phone was a lifeline, and to think that uh, they went after it, you know, I think it says a lot about the individuals and uh, those who commissioned um, that crime. And so, you know, I think if I were to write the report now, I will probably cr have a bigger section on, on surveillance than I did at the time, because, uh, you know, with what we know now, um, and with the chilling effect that these aims are creating, um, and you know, with the fact that more people around him were targeted, I would have put more emphasis on it. Luckily, I think um, uh, Brian, um, the, the movie maker who did uh, The Dissident, did highlight greatly, if you have not seen the movie, please go and see it. He really spent fantastic amount of um, uh, resources and time unpacking not only the surveillance process, but also the instrumentalization and misuse of social media for the purpose of mm -hmm. creating chilling impact on, on reporting uh, and on the, um, uh, the leadership, I will say, of, uh, of Jamal as a journalist. So mm -hmm. I, will do, I will probably put more space to that particular issue yeah. now. Yeah, I think it, there's there's room for an, an addendum. I mean, that that I guess this is this was my point is that like now is actually the moment for us to be able to respond comprehensively to this unlawful surveillance um, juggernaut <laughs> that's that's become apparent and its impact on you know the impact on the right to life. I mean, the, you know, the, the fact is that he and many others 
um, you know, may no longer be alive or may, you know, may have lost their freedom. Many people who we've seen the Pegasus project are currently detained as a result uh, of the infection of their phones. And which is the perfect handover, I think, to, to Mary Lola, Lola, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights defenders. Um, um, you know, given what you've heard um, and also, of course, what you've experienced in your role as Special Rapporteur, it would be great to hear more from you about how unlawful targeted surveillance by states and companies is, as we've just discussed, posing a threat to human rights defenders and to journalists. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to be here, but I'll, I'll be speaking broadly from the uh, mandate of the human rights defender mandate. Um, I suppose we're inching towards a time where we can meet in person, but because we are still reliant on the online world, this brings with it more dangers, uh, the sort of dangers that we've been talking about so far today. And so I took up the mandate 18 months ago, and since then I have talked every day to human rights defenders. I've met hundreds and hundreds of human rights defenders, and many tell me their fears are about being put under some kind of surveillance. Um, some of these uh, are uh, some sorry some some of these are the sort revealed in the Pegasus project. Sometimes the surveillance is more traditional, uh, being followed on foot, being shouted at in person, having uh, threats posted on social media or delivered in phone calls, or being filmed or having their offices or their homes bugged. Um, so we know that illegal targeted surveillance is both an attack in itself, but it can also be a prelude to other forms of attack. Earlier this year, I presented a report to the Council, the UN Human Rights Council, on the murders of human rights defenders and the threats that often precede them. Because many killings, not all, but many killings come after a period of, uh, of surveillance. And the other thing we also have to remember is the specific nature of gendered threats um, in terms of um, online and uh, traditional um, surveillance. Um, so, and uh, one of the things that was very startling to me was the amount of people uh, who prior to having been killed uh, had received threats. Um, and, and it seemed to be that sometimes they, it would start with stigmatization, de defamation online, and then it would move offline to physical attack. And then the, the climate would be set up whereby in some cases they could be killed. Um, and that's why I think uh, offline or online surveillance or targeting of human rights defenders, not only is an abuse in itself, um, but it often enables and indicates further attacks. And while intervening at the surveillance stage could prevent some of the physical attacks, we see little appetite for action by governments and complete impunity uh, to protect defenders from surveillance and attacks. And of course, often it is the governments, as we know, that is doing the surveilling. And surveillance in any form is also a message to defenders who aren't under direct surveillance themselves, telling them that unless they behave, it's going to be them whose home is watched or whose home or whose phone is hacked next. Uh, so I think we should see uh, the sort of a surveillance exposed in the Pegasus project as part of a wider, longer history of surveillance. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think also the intersectionality issue here, which you raise in terms of the gendered component of surveillance as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like just the experience that you've had in terms of speaking to women human rights defenders and their fears about surveillance? Because um, I know a number of people who are working together with Access Now who talk about the fact that you know their gender identity also compounds um, both the power that they have but also the vulnerability that they have 
So I'm interested to hear if you have any thoughts on gender, human rights defenders, and surveillance as a kind of, you know, as a sort of problematic yeah, well, trio. Well, I mean, surveillance is always very, very um, frightening for people. And, you know, with women and LGBTI people who are targeted not only for what they're doing, but also for who they are, in 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 uh, states you know in in hostile states and uh, uh, where they don't fit cultural and societal norms it can be even more uh, uh, more disgusting and uh, and it and and also because they have a primary um, care duty with the family they're also afraid and we have seen in so many cases that uh, 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 women defenders who are being surveilled, uh, they, they, you know, they, some of the threats they get are about their families, and they're very afraid, you know, of their families. And even, even yesterday, I was talking to a young woman in Afghanistan, and uh, she's getting messages uh, on her phone from the Taliban, and uh, she's been told that he's watching her, he knows where she is, and he wants to marry her. And she says it isn't just that isn't just her experience, it's the experience of a lot of young women human rights defenders in Afghanistan. And it's not just, I mean, it's, 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 I always say, you know, governments are driven by their political and strategic interests. And, you know, they play the game of human rights. But, you know, to be honest, there are very few governments. In fact, I think every government has its own little list, because every government is balancing their own uh, political and strategic interests. But where you have really hostile governments and uh, where you have governments who have no interest in, in, in human rights or protecting human rights defenders, or where you have governments who are unable or un unwilling or the climate or the uh, the cultural, um, uh, the patriarchal climate or the lust for power is, as we know, very prevalent. You see the kind of threats, for example, I'll give you one which uh, I thought was awful because the threat came from a woman. Um, it, it was uh, in Mozambique and it was a woman called Fatima uh, Mimbera who was, um, uh, she was working on women and children's rights and she got threatened. Uh, and death threats on social media. And then uh, a member of parliament, a woman called Alice Thomas, uh, uh, from the ruling party, the Mozambique, it was Mozambique yeah, Liberation Front, she called for her, she, sorry, she called for her to be raped by 10 strong energetic men. Uh, and that shocked me because it, it just, I suppose you kind of hope that women uh, would have more empathy and more, uh, and, and generally they do. It, it, it is a, a, an unusual, um, it is an unusual um, uh, 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 example. But at the same time, I think what it shows is that uh, people who are working for governments, who are, who are um, uh, pushing forward a government line are always uh, vulnerable to, to uh, mm -hmm not telling the truth or uh, being being uh, respectful and correct in their own behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we can see that as, as Agnes kind of indicated that, you know, it's it's all governments that are, I mean, well, it's many governments that have been listed in the Pegasus, but it's, it's democracies and non-democracies alike. And whether it's, you know, we saw in France, for instance, in India, in Germany, you know, we're seeing the use of surveillance technology plus the calling out sort of, how frightening it is, you know, governments are saying how frightening democracies are saying how problematic it is that surveillance equipment is being used and then it, and at the same time are using it themselves. So there's a real in, inconsistency here and a, and a, and a hypocrisy. Um, um, thank you very much for talking from the perspective of, of the human rights defender. And I, I would love to hand over to Mohammed actually at this point. Um, Mohammed, maybe you can give us a sense of the kind of evolving landscape of human rights defenders globally, but also your own personal experience. 
Thank you very much, Pratt, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in these events. Um, I I want to to focus on what threat that human rights defenders are uh, uh, facing. When we look to the threats and break them down, we will see how digital and physical threats are connected. As amazing uh, Mary say, um, I also want to answer the most important question: Are these threats only suffered by the human rights defenders? When human rights defender is targeted and and uh, the state and the supporter group uh, of the state also target his family his friend or also his colleagues and the targeting circle is became bigger and bigger is that everyone get targeted because they related to the human rights defenders or they are trying to be uh, pressured by uh, the state or the supporting group so the number of victims is growing all the time within the context of the state revenge against only one human rights defenders, there is a lot of victims because of work of one human rights defenders. When Samir campaign, Samir campaign on social media to do the adoptions of views that state or society don't like, turn to the killing of the person. We must pause for a moment to find out how much human rights defenders live in a fear. In every region of the world, arrest and detentions continue to be the most common reported violation used by the state to undermine or stop the work of human rights defenders. Often there is no human rights, no information about human rights defenders who disappeared, and we saw that a lot in, in Iraq uh, and other countries. Uh, when they disappear after they arrest, there's they totally no information. When we look to the what is the what is the digital threats that human rights defenders uh, is facing? First, explode loopholes in uh, applications and operating systems that um, NSO and Bigasus uh, is using. They are selling the bugs rather than to inform the companies. They selling the bugs to the um, to the governments and the governments using that bugs to infect our um, um, our devices. Internet censorship, and this is one of the things that also human rights defenders is under thing. Internet uh, shutdowns also, uh, that's one of the things that also part of that uh, threats. Digital repressions and, and access now definitely have a lot of information, like how the private companies, online platforms, and state is do a dig digital repressions. Um, the, the, the platforms is suspending human rights defenders accounts even though that's the only the only um, media and platforms that for human rights defenders especially in in the in the re in, in mina region or in africa they the only way is to, to express themselves is using the, the online platforms and digital harassments that's happening and especially against women human rights defenders and lgbt as um, lgbt human rights defenders as uh, mary say and also one of the important things that Economic and technology sanctions is also affecting human rights defenders. We think that these sanction is only affecting the repressive country, but actually it's affecting a lot of hum uh, on human rights defenders. We saw that in Iran, we saw that in Sudan, that um, that sanction is really affecting human rights defenders and lead them to, to use um, fake apps that government use that um, methods to infect their devices. And, and many of these threats started online, but ended in physical risks, like killing human rights defenders, kidnapping. Killing human rights defenders, we saw a really important case in, in Iraq when a, human, a woman human rights defender killed because a picture uh, was posted online. Kidnapping, physical violence, sexual harassment, uh, arrest. And all these goes to as you mentioned before, Brad, it's like self-censorship. People start to, to, human rights defenders start to fear. Economic and social pressure against the human rights defenders and their families. We saw a lot of cases that human rights defenders and their families get um, uh, um, sacked from their um, work, uh, prevent them to, to, uh, to get uh, a government um, uh, uh, services. Uh, many human rights defenders have stopped working, and especially uh, women human rights defenders and LGBT. Uh, many human rights defenders have moved away from the social life and their families out of uh, fear of them. 
Right, I, I, I live in a region that targeting human rights uh, defenders constantly and the yeah. way and, and the only way these activists can protect themselves is be, be, is being ahead of the local authorities when it comes to protecting their information and the information these uh, they define the, they, they defend. There was a, these challenges faced by human rights defenders in the war today, they're still struggling to promote human rights principles. Their families, friends often supporting them to continue uh, this danger journey. Finally, I would like to point out the importance of com coming uh, United Nations General Assembly resolution on human rights defenders. And I will want to mention three points. One, surveillance company must be ob obliged to carry out uh, uh, at court, uh, human rights uh, uh, do the challenges and take steps to ensure that human rights defenders don't continue to become target of uh, unlawful uh, surveillance. Secondly, government using this technology must put in place a transparent role, uh, rule of law based on requirement for any of use of spyways. Any government that fails to develop such a requirement or that has a pattern of abuse and we know that a lot of governments have a pattern of abuse should be on a global no transfer list finally protect and promote strong encryption as you say we are today in the encryption day um all support to the human rights defenders and thank you so much for uh inviting me for this event thanks Mohammed. um again so many follow-up questions for you and thank for, thank you for painting the picture of the experience of many human rights defenders um one of the things that you mentioned is that many human rights defenders have kind of stopped working or have moved out of the country um and i just want to know the kind of the transnational um, nature of surveillance in the sense that you know often human rights defenders who have been at risk have self-exiled have left the country have left the jurisdiction but now because of transnational surveillance, um, the experience that they're having is that they're being surveilled outside of the country, which is also putting people who are, they're back, that they're in communication in, with in the country at risk. And I'm just wondering whether that's also, you know, sort of impacting the role of the diaspora uh, human rights defender community. Yeah, it's definitely bright. People, uh, the human rights defender who is in exile are um, really trying to be, um, to stop communicating with human rights defender inside the countries because they think that they could put them at risk, especially uh, if we lock on the, on the, on the uh, uh, tourist list, that tour, uh, tourism list that um, uh, government now do, a blacklist for human rights defenders. Yeah. A lot of yeah. a lot of governments is is uh, trying to put the human rights defenders on on a list that blocking them uh, from uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. any kind of uh, uh, government services or, uh, yeah. or allowing them to back again to the country. So that's one of the elements that a lot of human rights defenders, even when they are in exile, they still at fear because their their family is in, still inside the country. Uh, um, their colleagues is still inside the country, but do you know what is what is the dif the difference that at least these people now can use the local uh, bodies uh, to um, uh, to uh, raise that issues with the local authorities. They can use a local mechanism. They can use the regional mechanism to uh, mm -hmm. to. Um, to complain against this. In, in MENA, we don't really have really a mechanism to complain. We cannot complain to against Saudi Arabia or UAE is using these tools. But when someone in exile in Europe or in, in the United States, they can use that mechanism to complain against the countries because they are, they are residents of this country and they get targeted. Which I think also is why this, this resolution at the General Assembly on Human Rights Defenders, including content, on surveillance is so important because it actually strengthens and empowers people within the country who might not have other mechanisms and to protect themselves. And also, you know, we haven't talked about export controls yet, but I would like to in the next section. Um, before we do so, let's, um, Mohammed, thank you so much. Let me um, bring Emily in. Emily, who is um, with Open Society Foundations, um, please, the floor is yours. 
Thanks, Brett. It's a privilege to be here and we're excited to be part of this event along with um, all of you. I would like to open by joining others in congratulating the government of Norway for once again displaying leadership in drafting and sponsoring the resolution on implementing the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. And uh, I know we've had such a rich conversation, so I will try not to repeat things that have already been said. And so I'll just make two brief uh, points. The first is to say that I think it, here we're worried that many of the emergency powers enacted in response to the pandemic have too often given governments powers to expand surveillance in the name of health and to limit assembly and expression. I think to date we've seen about 110 states have done so. So this resolution rightly calls um, on states that these powers must be necessary and proportionate and importantly, of a limited time. Um, and so it also says that states must ensure that these measures are not used to target and silence defenders, civil society and journalists or hinder their work online and offline. And I think we've heard um, in this conversation about how surveillance has done just that. So we would go further and add that we think these measures need to be rescinded and repealed as soon as possible and that states need to commit to developing and implementing roadmaps to extinguish and sunset emergency powers um, and uh, as part of their uh, commitment to this resolution. Um, we see the Summit for Democracies and the Open Government Partnership Summits as two great places where governments could come out with their roadmaps to tell us just what their plans are for rescinding these emergency powers. But I think we think that's an important piece in this puzzle. And I guess, uh, Brett, you won't be surprised that the second point I'm raising is on resources. Um, I think we note that the resolution calls on states to develop effective protection mechanisms for defenders at risk, um, and that these are appropriately resourced. And I think um, here at the Open Society Foundations, we're funding several outstanding protection networks and mechanisms operating at a national, regional, and global level but most of these networks are still working on shoestring budgets and overwhelmed with what we're seeing as an exponential increase in the demand for their services, especially when you see the kinds of attacks that we've been discussing today. Um, and then the, the, the opportunity for those kinds of attacks to uh, cover ever more numbers of activists, civil society folks, and um, journalists. So we see that organizations need more funding now to support um, and do the work of protection, particularly responding to the kind of digital threats we're discussing today. And they need, uh, they need to be able to do so in a timely manner. And so we're hoping that as part of their proposal to implement this resolution, states will also commit publicly to additional targeted investments um, in support of defender networks and show the necessary political support and ambition to match the, the needs that we're seeing in the field. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Uh, and thanks for, for OSF's support to many organizations who are working in the field of public health and the response um, to um, or government res response to the health crisis by you know, establishing emergency powers and additional surveillance laws. I think this is extremely significant. Uh, and it's great to be able to both draw attention to it and also to be able to have resources to respond. Um, I, I just wanted to bring in actually the comments that were made, by, uh, the statement that was made by Michelle Bachelet, uh, who's the High Commissioner for Human Rights, where she says, and it was it just reminded me after the point that you made, Emily, about rescinding of powers and when when, it, when is it appropriate to be able to surveil? And she said, um, after the Pegasus project, I would like to remind all states that surveillance measures can only be justified in narrowly defined circumstances with a legitimate goal. And they must be both necessary and proportionate to that goal. She goes on to say that, um, that surveillance technology can only ever be justified in the context of investigations into serious crimes and grave security threats. And I don't see a public health crisis <laughs> uh, fitting within that, 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 that um, the small exceptions. Um, so we have actually um, an additional um, and welcome um, speaker from the floor, which is Mark Zellenrath, 
who's the ambassador and deputy permanent representative to the, of the uh, Kingdom of the Netherlands. Um, so please let me welcome you. And I'll also come back with some more questions. We have about 25 minutes left. Um, if people who are watching would like to post questions in the chat, please do so. There's already a whole barrage of questions that have come in. Um, and I'd also like us to start to think about um, some of the solutions. We've definitely talked about, um, about moratoriums. We've talked about um, 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 rescinding of emergency powers. We've talked about um, export controls a little. Uh, there's a, um, we, we, we need to talk about the role of the companies, both in terms of their self-regulation and self-monitoring, but more importantly, about national controls of companies that are oper operating within their own domiciled state, but also uh, globally as well. But uh, over to you, uh, Mark, please, Ambassador. Thanks, Brett. And thanks for getting us together. What a fascinating panel this was and still is. I, I especially when Sadat spoke, uh, of the wire, uh, it took me back to when the Pegasus story broke. I, I clearly remember sitting on my couch and getting like a news alert from the Guardian. And uh, I spent, uh, I think, two hours after that just reading absolutely everything uh, because that was just monumental work. And I think when it comes to the awareness issue, uh, it has been incredibly important. I think it's been a landmark piece of journalism, incredibly powerful and frightening. Uh, in many aspects. And I think, Brett, what you said, uh, and let me just um, touch on that, and that's what to do uh, also as a government. Uh, you spoke about arms export control, and I think that is a major part of the solution that we can work on now, and that is something that we are already doing now, at least uh, for my government. Uh, because uh, like you said, and it's been mentioned before, it's, it's basically surveillance is dual use. You can use it to have legitimate surveillance of security threats, whether they're terrorists or espionage, or whether it's any kind of criminal network that needs to be uh, under surveillance. But of course, you can also use it to uh, put the thumb on human rights defenders or journalists or people that should not be uh, surveilled in that intrusive manner. Uh, so just like you can use chlorine to clean your house, uh, but also to build chlorine bombs, or you can use aluminium tubes to uh, outfit your house and to build a bomb, uh, we should classify this kind of technology as dual use. It needs to be added on arms export control regimes. And we have done so within the European Union. So certain parts of uh, what is surveillance technology is now part of that European updated checklist on dual use regulation. So that means that any company wishing to export that kind of technology needs to go to a rigorous, rigorous checklist that need to be followed in order for them to be able to export that technology. And as you know, or uh, perhaps not, but when it comes to dual use technologies, one of their criteria very clearly is human rights. So you need to be, you need to ensure as the company that your technology, if it's going to be exported, will not be used for human rights violation. And I think that is also where the Pegasus uh, research comes in. Uh, I think we have a pretty strong, uh, clear body of evidence here, or at least, you know, uh, um, uh, the reporting on, on what is certain countries have done with this technology uh, would make it exceedingly difficult for companies to export that kind of technology to those countries. Um, the second part, uh, and, and maybe also to add on, so this is the European Union. Uh, there's also, and I don't want to get too technical here, but there's something called the Vossenaar Agreement, which is a larger group of countries that have made agreements on export control of dual use technologies. We're certainly also trying to get this into this much larger Vossenaar Agreement, uh, but that, of course, will also uh, uh, mean that more countries will need to agree to add that to the list. And uh, that is something that we uh, can't achieve overnight, unfortunately. Um, the other part, I think, what you've mentioned and, and what many panelists have mentioned, of course, is uh, regulations. I think uh, you quoted Ms. Bachelet. I think she said it uh, perfectly. Um, uh, part of it, of course, is also uh, increasing awareness uh, you know about the Freedom Online Coalition, undoubtedly, of which we're also a member. Uh, and I think these kind of coalitions uh, serve to push this, that message further, that if uh, we have uh, surveillance technologies, they need to be within the frame of international 
law. It needs to defend human rights. It needs to be unequivocal uh, in national legislation in that regard. And that is certain also a message that we will continue to push as the Netherlands. So thank you, Brett. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you for also for putting the the European Union export controls on the agenda. Um, you know, I was speaking to my colleague the other day, and it's true that to I think to a large degree that the European Union is really the place where we're seeing um, global internet regulation. You know, like if we look at the GDPR for an ex example. Um, you know, it, it's managed to set the standards globally for the way in which data is protected. Um, there's been a lot of work done on, within the European Union on export um, controls. Um, I think the, the, the analysis certainly from my organisation and I think more broadly from civil society is that it's a good start. Um, but there are a lot of this, there are a lot of holes still within that export control framework, both in terms of transparency, um, looking at um, the description of the end user um, and that being public, you know, Pegasus basically, NSO basically said that, you know, the end user is not really of their concern or rather, you know, they've sold it in good faith and if it ends up affecting a particular end user, um, you know, it's beyond their control, they have no access to the databases and so on. So this idea about who really is the end user and who is the affected population, um, the value of the license, the number of licenses per item, like there, there's, there, there, it is, as you say, a very good development, but there's a, a lot more work to be done. And similarly, I think on Wasana, um, again, like it's, it's great to see the arrangement, um, but we need it to happen now. We need those inclusions in the agreement um, so that all states are actually controlling the, the movement of surveillance equipment. As Anya said, it's, you know, it needs to be considered as a weapon. Um, but thank you also for the for the Dutch government's leadership on many of these issues, including on your protect your statements on encryption as well over many years. So thank you very much. Um, so um, questions to the um, to, from the from the audience. Um, I mean, and it's actually very relevant to this you know right now. And I think I'll open it up to anyone on the panel who'd like to speak. Um, what do you think that states should do to address this problem? And this is, it's a rather broad question, but many have already joined the Freedom Online Coalition and also the Wasana arrangement. Um, are they actively are they active enough in combating spyware? So you know this is really a, a question on the role of the state. Um, any suggestions from either those who are representative of states or uh, from the um, from civil society or indeed from the special rapporteur on this question about what more could states be um, doing beyond the Freedom Online Coalition or the implementation of the Wassenaar our arrangement? Well, I, if I may, I think there is a, a, a great deal more that um, uh, that states ought to do. I think um, the first um, uh, the first important focus is to check what is the domestic framework regarding surveillance. Yeah. Um, because uh, many countries around the world, including uh, democracies, have very improper protection against surveillance uh, within their own territories. So I think it is quite important for uh, the revision of domestic legislation so that it can impose limits on digital surveillance. We need to ensure that surveillance is governed by precise publicly accessible laws, that it's only against specified person authorized by a competent, independent, impartial judicial body, that there are limitations on time, manner, and scope, um, and that it is subject to, to detailed record keeping uh, regular reporting to Parliament, and so on and so forth. The fact that the legislation and the practice at domestic level are so problematic, that is feeding uh, the practice of NSO and others. And it's certainly uh, preventing the uh, effective um, response to the kind of uh, extraterritorial spying that we can see. So I will say that's a, a very important uh, role that, um, that states can do, can play. And then in, with regard to, digit, to what happened in relation to the Pegasus project, um, 
I think there is an important role for Parliament on the on the legislation in terms of overseeing what their governments are doing. In the aftermath of, of Pegasus, we've had a lot of governments talking a little bit, but frankly, overall, the response were fairly muted. Uh, and even in cases where their prime minister or president were targeted, such as in my country, France, the public response has been very muted. So that leads me to believe that we really need to rely on parliament to play their watchdog role in a much more forceful fact fashion, and we need to use strategic litigation. So court, I think, have a fundamental role to play to protect us against that kind of surveillance if our governments uh, are failing to, uh, to take the, um, the appropriate measures. Thank you. I have other ideas, but that's uh, for the moment. You no, know, that's excellent. And thanks also for bringing up the issues of litigation, because I think often the courts are the backstop. You know, we've seen in the constitutional courts, in the high courts, uh, including, you know, in India and other countries where they've, they've actually um, um, found that the use of, of spyware is, you know, is actually is unlawful. Um, and, and so perhaps um, um, I might see if there's another person who would like to respond to that question about the role of the state. Uh, and then I'd like to, to move to the role of the company, because I think that it's absolutely essential that we look at, and there's a question that's been posed, and I'll just actually ask it now so that uh, people are aware of it, which is what, what should companies do? And can we trust them to police themselves? There's obviously an interface between the, co the company and the state as well in terms of what is the regulatory environment in which they operate in, both in terms of their own um, national space, but also when they export. Um, but let's come back to that company question uh, in a second. Uh, over to someone on the issue of, um, of state action. Brett, I would just come in again um, to, to say, I think that an important step right now is to rescind all these emergency powers. I think we've seen that in the last you know, couple of years, these power measures have greatly expanded. They've expanded the power of government to surveil. They've also expanded the power of government to limit assembly, limit expression, um, and to do the kinds of work that I think Agnes has outlined would be needed at the domestic level. And so I think we need states to commit sooner rather than later to clear roadmaps for rescinding these powers. And maybe just to repeat again, um, if we are given the threats we're seeing, I think we really need to see governments step up um, the resources they're willing to give to civil society to um, mount protection here. I think we've seen a lot of talk about the need to protect offenders at risk, but the reality is that still those resources remain um, far lower than what the challenges required. And I think this is a great opportunity for governments to step in with expanded resources for human rights defender protection, journalist protection, and other kinds of civil society protection essential to pushing back on this kind of surveillance. Mm. The problem, of course, is when the state is actually the perpetrator. Um, and I think we're seeing that in, in, in many instances. Um, just do, let's, um, let's, let's, let's transition to, to the role of the company. Um, and, you know, maybe, um, Mary Lua, I could perhaps ask you um, if you have a perspective on this, because, you know, all of the special rapporteurs, they wrote to the NSO group about what happened in Pegasus, with Pegasus. And there was a four or five page letter that was returned where they basically deflected all responsibility and said, you know, this is about state regulation. This is about the problem of encryption, et cetera. And do you have any perspective um, on, you know, whether the companies are able to police themselves or what kind of framework should be in place, whether it be global or national to rein in the role of the surveillance, the privatized surveillance sector? Yeah. Um, thanks very much, and quite rightly, you you know you you pointed out that the UN independent experts uh, did address the Pegasus issue, and I joined that. But regarding companies, um, at the moment, I want to pick up on something I Mohammed said. Uh, the EU directive, the forthcoming EU directive on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence 
which is going, coming down the tracks in probably November, it will be published. And then, of course, it has to go through the process in Parliament and all of that. Uh, but I think like one of the things I'm trying to trying to push for is that human rights defenders would be included in the risk analysis uh, and the mandatory human rights due diligence and environmental due diligence process that states uh, under this directive, uh, whether they are either EU companies or um, working somewhere else uh, that they have to abide by, because I think that's really important um, because we see so many killings taking place in the context of business and human rights. And uh, when, when and companies like, you know, we we did a mapping, I, I'm from Ireland, so we, I did, we did a mapping in Trinity College of the Irish companies and the Irish multinationals and all of that. And, you know, so few of them understand anything about the UN guiding principles and their responsibility. And I think we really need to try and push that more. But I think the very concrete way at this precise moment in time, because everything in a lot is in due to is, is, you know, if you get the timing right and you're a bit lucky, you can uh, do something. Some states like France and Germany, and there's other moves in other states, are bringing in their own national legislation on uh, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence for companies. And as I said, the EU directive is coming down the tracks and that will apply to uh, the whole of the EU. So I would like to see more of this and I would like to see defenders uh, really integrated into that whole process as the people who can uh, who can actually um, help explain to companies um, how better they can uh, uh, diminish their own risks of operating, as well as uh, the effect and the impact that it can have when yeah. companies don't don't understand. Yeah, and I'd also at this juncture also like to bring in the role of the investors as well in these in these yeah. technology um, in yeah. these surveillance companies because. We've seen with like Novel, Novel Pina Capital and other, um, you know, there's deliberate purchasing of these companies because they're actually super profitable. You know, this is a multi-million, if not billion dollar sector. Um, I would definitely say that self-regulation is, you know, sort of out of the question at this point, particularly given the, the life and death consequences of such technologies. Um, would anybody else like to, to jump in, Siddharth? We haven't heard from you for a while. Um, um, and then maybe, Agnes, I can see you wanted to say yeah, something. Yeah, I just wanted to react because we are releasing a report today on 21st of October on the role of investors of those companies. So I just want to invite um, colleagues and listeners to check on this uh, amnesty report, which uh, outlined the material risk uh, including reputational, financial, legal risk that the mm -hmm. companies are facing, including investors. And investors have a key role to play, as you pointed out, Brett, and mm -hmm. the report highlights a, a range of um, recommendations. I, I very much look forward to, to, to reading that because the... Um, you know the tech, the, the the investors are liable. I mean, they must be liable for this, and 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 so must the boards as well that are responsible for authorizing the executives to produce these sorts of weapons, and then to sell them and to do so in a way that is non-transparent. Um, you know, or, and or you know, at best, blind to the potential consequences of. of, of of such technologies. Siddharth, are you wanting to jump in? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think an important um, an important test case is going to be how the uh, Facebook slash WhatsApp lawsuit against the NSO group in California proceeds. Yeah. We know that the, the preliminary finding was that the trial will proceed, that the, the judge did not accept NSO group's claim that uh, as the uh, vendor of uh, spyware to sovereign governments, it had no oversight or control and, the, and uh, over how its clients use this. And the fact that uh, this proceeding is going to carry on uh, I think is uh, quite significant. In India, I should, I should uh, inform uh, everybody listening in that the matter, you know, a number of victims of Pegasus moved the Indian Supreme Court. And uh, what's astonishing is that the government of India uh, refused to answer a pointed question from the, from the court. Uh, had it, you know, it was the Chief Justice's bench where he wanted them to submit an affidavit 
saying, look, do you, uh, have, you uh, have you bought and do you use Pegasus? And the government refused to answer that question. And right. uh, now the court is going to decide how to proceed in the face of uh, demands by victims that there be some kind of independent investigation. So I'm hoping that there will be some kind of judicial prodding or action uh, in India too on this. Mm -hmm. And, and a, a, another topic that's worth to put on the agenda, even though we haven't really time to discuss it, is the question of remedy. Uh, and, you know, what is the impact and, and consequences for the individual in terms of, you know, all the things that we've talked about, like including loss of life? Um, and, and so what are the consequences in terms of the regulatory environment and the legislative environment that provides remedy uh, to, to, to the victims of company practice? Uh, uh, and and we've seen some companies kind of investigate the, the sort of the issue of remedy, including companies like you know Facebook and and others, not necessarily to implement it, but certainly to be aware now um, that there is real life consequences of some of these practices. Um, I might just and, see and Mohammed. Sorry, Brett. I think it's important to highlight the fact that those companies are actually. Um, well, of course, we need to investigate each and every case, but we mm -hmm. need to talk about corporate complicity Absolutely. in human rights violation. And I think it's yeah. really important to raise uh, the, the stake here a little bit with those guys. And uh, they need to understand that um, uh, according, at least, you know, according to the most uh, recent jurisprudence on corporate complicity, what NSO is doing and possibly what uh, other social media companies are doing could fit very well within the criteria that has been determined to constitute corporate complicity, i.e. that the company's conduct enabled, exacerbated or facilitated the abuse that's clearly the case with NSO, and B, that the company knew or reasonably should have known that the abuse right. will occur. In exactly. the case of NSO, they had been repeatedly told for years that some of their clients were misusing, abusing the spyware to target human rights defenders and journalists, number one. So they should know, they should have known, if they're not, they knew, and B, that kind of surveillance leading to worse violations would not be possible without the spyware. So I think the threshold of corporate complicity is right there, is right there for us to litigate for and to mm -hmm. litigate against. And those companies need to be aware of the fact that there will be people doing so. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to hand back to Mohammed. Um, because I'm sure you have some reflections upon this and, and really is, you know, we've talked about it in my organisation as like which of us are human rights defenders, which of us are defenders of defenders, which of us are defenders of defenders of defenders. And, um, you know, this topic is about surveillance and human rights defenders. And I think, Mohammed, you feel and fulfil a number of those categories, both as a human rights defender yourself um, and as a defender of others. Can you give us the last word? Yeah, I just want to mention that, I mean, having um, a, a law or having declaration, it will not work if the states they don't implement this in the relation with uh, the repressed uh, countries. Like we have um, a guidance for human rights defenders in EU. How many people of human rights defenders outside EU know about the guidance? So it is important to, to, to put the, the, it's important to educate the human rights defenders about these things. They educate the human rights defenders about mechanisms that they can use. They educate about guidelines and they, to tell them that this is available, you can use it. Um, and also, like in the other side, the state is ready to, to meet with the human rights defenders, to talk with the human rights defenders. I'm personally, I'm personally live in fear because I work in, in, the, in the region and this region is, you can see that a lot of countries is using Pegasus. So uh, targeting me, that means also targeting the other human rights defenders, I work with them. So this is a extra um, extra pressure on me and extra pressure on the also the, the, the human rights defenders. The idea is not to have um, 
resolutions and that's it the idea how we implement that resolution on the our relation with the with with the countries like uh, Saudi Arabia uh, UAE uh, Morocco and other countries in the region or outside Mexico uh, and uh, India so this is is a very important and the other side regarding the the, the companies um I think the 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 companies as as and you say that they know that they they their tools abuse when we look as example to uh, MSS, like the the company in French, where uh, they uh, they sell that to to Libya and Libya abuse that tools and people get tortured because of information collected by this uh, tools. Uh, uh, they know that happened and they know that uh, this tool selling to repressed country it will abuse because there is no monitoring for how they use it. There is um, no one will can. Uh, um, act at least a protest against this because anyone will protest in 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 Saudi Arabia as example will be arrested or will be uh, targeted so that's how how it is important is it's it's resolution is great great but how to implement that resolution is a very important and also mm -hmm. regarding the uh, regarding the uh, companies it's, it's it's they i mean we cannot say that they don't know they definitely know when they sell these to countries uh, they have a, a history of human rights violations, uh, uh, and that that's a very important uh, issue. Thanks, uh, Brett. Thank you. And I guess this, you know, this question about implementation is is probably you know a, a good place to end. Which is, we need the resolution. We need the resolution um, at the at the human at the general assembly. We need the Human Rights Council to respond to the letter that was sent to them calling for them to denounce um, surveillance uh, technologies. Um, we need the national uh, domestic legislation. We need independent courts. We need companies to look unto themselves and, 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 and reflect upon what they're selling, as well as to have fierce regulation uh, on top of that. And we need to look at issues around corporate, corporate complicity, uh, as Agnes uh, suggested. Um, we need to strengthen the Wassana Agreement uh, we need to strengthen the European Union uh, uh, export controls and a range of other practices. But all of that requires, I mean, a range of other um, strategies, but all of that requires implementation. And I just want to finish off with, a, a, just to bring it back to the issue of, of gender, um, a comment that was made uh, on the chat from um, a woman by the name of, who I just saw, uh, which I just thought was, of Cynthia on the, on, watching on YouTube, who's asked us to emphasize the importance of having a gendered lens when, when looking at surveillance. It is critical to see the nuance, she said, in our analysis, as defenders may face different risks. And I think that's absolutely central to this, that it's not one size fits all, uh, that there's a whole community of people who are, who are requiring a tailored response. So thank you very much to everybody. We've had a few minutes over, only three minutes. Thank you to Amnesty International and to my own organisation, Access Now, all the people who worked on it behind the scenes, uh, and then our co-sponsors, Norway, the Office of the United Nations with the Special Rapporteur of Human Rights Defenders, uh, ISHR, Civicus, OSF, and in particular, I'd like very much to thank the speakers, um, uh, Mr. Odin Kalheim, Siddharth um, Varadajan, Agnes Kalamad, Mary Lola, Mohamed al Muscadi, Emily Martinez, uh, our representative from the Dutch government. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. And I, I know that this is not the end of the discussion. Actually, we're right bang smack in the middle of it. This is the perfect time for action. And I look forward to seeing what lies ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been very useful, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.